Uh, thanks very much, Tim. It's a great pleasure to be here today in London to present the ITU background reports. In fact, there are two reports. We did a background report for the Kyoto Symposium, and since that time, we did a somewhat expanded and, and slightly different report, which I am almost embarrassed to say we provided paper copies of outside this room. So I hope that you all picked up a copy. Uh, but as Tim mentioned, as, as, uh, uh, this is, uh, as Tim mentioned as well, I want to present, uh, start with the global framework, which is something that no one else is going to be discussing in the next two days, as well as the evidence for climate change, um, some basic points about ICTs and the way that these are being looked at in global negotiations, and finally, I2 and climate change. While we take the admonition to look forward and not, not look back, I would note that ITU first began work in this area in 1994 in Kyoto when we adopted Resolution 35 on ICTs and the environment. But obviously, the issue has grown in amplitude since that time. To start, uh, can you go back? Oh, it seems to be missing. Well, good. Some of my slides are missing, so you'll just have to uh, listen to what I say and not read the screen. Let me start with the global framework because it's very much in the news these days. Uh, we start the story in 1992, which was the adoption of a framework convention on climate change. But despite those words, it was not a binding commitment. So that led five years later, in 1997, in Kyoto again, to the Kyoto Protocol, which we are much more familiar with. And the Kyoto Protocol was adopted by something called the COP. If you don't have the slide, I don't really have to explain it, but COP stands for Conference of the Parties which is important because it means this is a governmental agreement. It is also a binding governmental agreement, and that was the big difference. While the convention had encouraged developed countries to stabilize their greenhouse gas emissions, the protocol committed them to do so. In the intervening years, additional details were worked out in 2001 at another conference of the parties. You have the, the beginning of the, the distinction between Annex I countries and Annex II countries. You may have heard that terminology. Annex I are developed countries. They have a binding commitment, most of them, to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions in the period that we're in right now, 2008 to 2012, a reduction of 5% against 1990 baseline uh, emissions. And as you've heard, the United Kingdom, and certainly as we heard in Kyoto, Japan, are two of the countries that have that commitment. Interestingly enough, we've heard reference to transport this morning. Aviation and shipping were not included in the Kyoto, in the Kyoto Protocol. And that's one of the issues on the global agenda right now. Do we adopt binding commitments for those two sectors? You also hear about the Annex II countries. These are developing countries, and they had no binding commitments. Their only commitment was, was to monitor and report on their emissions. So a very fundamental distinction between those countries with binding commitments and those without. Another important element of the process in, Proto in Kyoto was the adoption of the Clean Development Mechanism, the CDM. And this is the idea that you can buy your way out of the problem by, by purchasing carbon credits, by sponsoring projects. And this has developed into a very large industry in its own right, which does use ICTs to conduct its business. Now, to come forward a little bit, in 2005, the Kyoto Protocol actually came into effect. So it's in effect for 177 countries. And that's why you hear a lot of talk about all the action that is needed to meet those uh, binding commitments. In 2007, and science again injected itself into the process, we have the fourth assessment report of the IPCC. This is the International Panel of Climate Change. I will catch up at some point. Um, which established, this was the first, uh, this was a major, major international scientific consensus which established a clear link between greenhouse gas emissions and between climate change. And also the report noted that greenhouse gas emissions continue to grow. And this report itself was, finally, was endorsed by, by governments a year later. And 2012 is another magic date. Now we're looking into the future, as we should. This is when the first commitment period under the Kyoto Protocol will expire, which means that a new framework is needed. So now, how, how do we get to a new framework? In December 2007 in Bali, a conference of the parties, parties means governments, it doesn't mean they had a party, the Conference of the Parties in Bali launched the process for a new negotiation, and in essence, to come to agreement on a new agreement to, to take the place of the Kyoto Protocol. Uh, being good international bureaucrats, they, uh, they agreed to form another committee, which is the Ad Hoc Working Group on Long-Term Cooperative Action. The shorthand is AWG-LCA, which is not really much shorter. And this group is charged to develop the work program for the agreements. Now, there have been already two meetings of this group in Bangkok at the end of March, 
And a bond, a, a major meeting concluded only last week. And the, and the third meeting will take place in Accra, Ghana in, in August. The focus of the work program under the global agreement or the new global agreement will be adaptation, which we will hear more about uh, tomorrow. Mitigation, we've heard some about that today and we'll hear more about it. Technology and financing. So there are four main uh, issues to be agreed to by, by governments. A new issue that's been added is deforestation. Um, so there really are five issues. The may, about at this time, after two meetings of this group, the major agreement is that the carbon, uh, the carbon credit mechanism will be continued. And that was uh, quite important to industry to know that. Apart from that, there really is no uh, formal text on the table as of yet. Uh, the timetable is to have a, the next meeting of the parties, which is COP14, in Poznan, Poland in December of this year. And that's when significant progress needs to be made toward the next global agreement on climate change. And finally, if all goes well, uh, the expectation is that a new agreement will be adopted and concluded in Copenhagen in December of 2009. So that is the, uh, the process for, for developing the replacement to the Kyoto Protocol. ITU itself has uh, been very involved in, in, in this process. We, of course, are not a, not a, a member a government, but we are a, an organization that represents 191 member states. And we have been trying to provide the ICT perspective to the global negotiations. Now, finally, evidence for climate change. I think the best evidence is that I left, uh, when I left Geneva, it seemed like it was December. We've been locked in rain and cloud for weeks, and I came to warm, sunny London. <laughs> so we know empirically that, and, and, uh, that there is some evidence for climate change. The IPCC report uh, has numbers that are compared since 1950. You can see an increase in global average temperature, an increase in the global average sea level of 10 centimeters, and a decrease in the snow cover in the northern hemisphere. Another interesting number in that report is that greenhouse gas emissions are up by 70% since 1970. So you get an idea of the, uh, the magnitude of the problem. And now we come to solutions. ICT as a cause of global warming. We don't use the word problem, cause. Um, I think you will have to take all these numbers with a bit of grain of salt, whether it's 2%, 2.5%, 3%, 3.1%, 3.5%. Depending on how you measure ICTs, it is a small but significant uh, contributor to global warming. And it, of course, as we are in the ICT community know, it's partly a success story. At the ITU, ITU, one of our main missions is to expand ICTs throughout, throughout the planet. So we've been happy to see that in the last 15 years or so, we've gone from 145 million mobile phones to more than 3 billion. That's a success story. But there's the other side of it, which is the, the, the emissions that are being produced by all this equipment. <coughs> If you look at this table, I think it does give you some basic uh, interesting insights. One is that telecoms, strictly speaking, contribute about 25%. Servers are almost a quarter of, of the pie chart. And as we know, servers are growing rapidly with the increased use of the internet and the increased uh, per person use of the internet to all kinds of broadband applications. And finally, PCs and monitors are the biggest part of the pie chart. There's been some interesting studies done lately that if you look at the average PC, about half of its, its emissions is in, is in its production. The other half is in its usage. So that's, uh, I think, also an important element in terms of what solutions we can find. Is it in, in the construction or in the use of the equipment? Now, how can ICTs uh, contribute and be part of the solution? One of the major areas and uses of ICTs that we're involved with the ITU is the monitoring of climate change. We will have a panel on this issue, so I won't uh, go into much detail at this point. But through the use of radars, and particularly through the use of satellite technology, we can, we can really get much more accurate information about the climate. Satellites can go where people can't go. They can measure uh, the changes in glaciers. They can measure things that are happening at the poles. And they have played a, an incredibly uh, useful role in that process since 1972. The ITU, we provide spectrum. We provide orbital slots for the satellites and also for the radars. Um, another interesting one is environmental monitoring. Um, we have uh, working with other UN agencies as well as others, other entities to develop uh, early warning systems for tsunamis, for, for typhoons, etc. It doesn't always work. It doesn't always reduce the problem, but in most cases it does. And there's other, many other activities going on, and we will have a separate session on that topic. I know that I'm speaking before lunch, so I will try and be a bit brief. Uh, the next is mitigation. I think this is really one of the key areas for the ICT community. Because ICT has, as we've heard this morning, I have to press it twice. And three times. Okay. 
there are various ways to look at this schematic. I think the simplest one is to say I ICT industry has to clean up its own act, and it certainly has an even more important role to help other sectors clean up their acts as well. Different ways, and directly we've heard uh, some excellent examples already this morning, but we, and we know that the new generation uh, networks and new technologies that are coming on board can reduce emissions by something in the order of 40%. Modern radio technologies, we have much more smart, everything is smart now, smart transmitters, which use much less energy. And we've even heard an example that if you, uh, with new switching centers and new servers, can sustain at work at higher temperatures, which means less need for cooling in switching centers and for routers. Indirectly, there's many examples of using ICTs for carbon abatement, video conferencing, uh, not the best example today, but in our daily practice is a very good example of how we can save, save emissions. Um, and we do that quite regularly at the ITU. More teleconferences, but certainly video conferences as well. And systematically, one way to say it is dematerialization, uh, which is basically doing things online instead of leaving the house. So every time you buy something at Amazon, you're helping to save the planet rather than go to the store. And intelligent transport systems, while it may be that uh, airlines are roughly similar to ICTs, as a whole, some estimates of the transport sector about 14 to 15 percent of total emissions. So that is a, an area that certainly can benefit from, from dematerialization. Now in the, in the sector itself, you will hear many examples in the next few days. I think we certainly recognize the award given to BT this morning. Uh, we have 60%, I think you said 58%, Donna, but we won't quibble, but that's a, a very impressive achievement. And we know that more is, uh, more is coming online. Etno members, the European Telecommunication Network Operators a Group, they have 25 members that have reduced their carbon emissions by about 7% since 2001 and carbon intensity by 14%. In Kyoto, we heard uh, very uh, excellent presentations by the Japanese ministry as, as to how their IT sector is going to reduce its emissions. And NTT itself has uh, saved considerable electri electricity consumption in the last few years. And you've heard it from already from the JESSE on their initiatives, and, and there are many other initiatives underway as well, and particularly in the area of servers which are a huge uh, user of, of energy. Well, I'll just click them all in at one time. Okay, ICTs for carbon abatement displays, and again, this is the use of ICTs really in other sectors to help, uh, to help uh, reduce emissions. There are many examples, these are just a few. Uh, these are all companies that are membership. For the few of you that are not familiar with ITU, we are not only member states, we have 191 member states. We also include more than uh, 600 private companies, which we call sector members. So we're very much a partnership between government and the private sector in the ITU. El Telstra, of course, is one of our sector members, and they make extensive use of video conferences. Flexible work arrangements, this is some, we've already heard the ways in which that can be achieved this morning. We're hoping to do something like that in the ITU in the near future. Intelligent transportation systems, uh, we have been very involved with smart car projects and other types of projects to make, a, to make a transport more intelligent. And again, dematerialization. It can't be uh, understated how the, the dramatic effect for ITU, of we, while we still do put out print publications and you can still buy print copies of publications, that we make many of our recommendations free online and this has saved uh, thousands of tons of paper as well as emissions. And also enabled a lot of people to get access to our recommendations that couldn't have them before. Final category, we've talked about mitigation and financing and technology are two other major issues in the global ne negotiations. A final issue is adaptation. Adaptation recognizes that uh, despite our best efforts, we are now seeing an increased cycle of extreme weather events, largely due to climate change. Every measurement of extreme weather events that we have right now is showing a sharp increase, and I think if you read the newspapers, I don't have to convince you of that point. Um, we are doing a lot in the ITU in this area. We, were one of, we really pioneered the Tom Perry Convention on Emergency Telecommunications for Disaster Relief and Mitigation. This was a convention that was uh, adopted in 1999 in Tom Perry, convention, in Tom Perry Finland. We, are, we have many other resolutions that deal with aspects of this issue, including use of radio communications and use, including use of ICTs for humanitarian assistance. And we know that when extreme weather events uh, hit, they usually hit hardest to developing countries. The small island developing states that are a threat from rising sea levels, earthquakes and, and, and typhoons in Asia recently have had done significant damage. So this is an issue that has tremendous effect on many of our membership, which are the least developed and developing countries. 
One thing I would point out on this list, though I think is particularly important for this meeting, is, is the, ne the one next to the bottom. One of the standards that the ITU does is country codes. I'm not an engineer, so this is one of the few standards I understand at the ITU. But we are, we are the ones who develop the country code system for the globe. And one of the few exceptions to country codes, which are given usually to countries, is 888, which was given for humanitarian purposes. And this is very important because usually when, 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 a natural, when extreme weather strikes, telecommunications is one of the first victims. Either uh, networks are knocked out or they're knocked down. And um, so there's a need for country codes, either, either to, for, to have a quick new system with new terminals, sometimes to have a country code that can operate on a regional basis. So this has been uh, one of the, one of our, one of a big contribution that we've made to this, this process. And adaptation has been one of the uh, most important issues to be dis being discussed in the global uh, arrangements. As you know, um, food security uh, has become a very key issue recently. Energy security has become a very key issue. So these are also elements of the issue of adaptation that we, could not, we should not lose sight of. Okay, finally. What about ITU itself? It's good to talk the talk, but we also are trying to walk the walk. In the last year, um, I, climate change clearly has been a, become a priority of the United Nations system, starting from the UN Secretary General on down, and we heard his message this morning. Um, we have, the UN system has also adopted a joint statement of all 25 agencies, programs, and funds, committing ourselves to achieve, or at least try to achieve, climate neutrality by the end of next year. And we are very, uh, very much at the forefront of this activity in the ITU. We are developing a knowledge base and repository for the link between ICTs and climate change. Uh, we are trying to position ITU as a strategic leader in the sense that we want to bring to the attention of world leaders and, and, and also to the private sector the importance of this issue for the IT sector and for, and for the global efforts to, to solve the problem of climate change. We are working to promote a global understanding through international foreign agreements. That means that we are participating actively in the global negotiations. And if in our own shop, we are having numerous meetings, such as this one, to develop the knowledge base on, on ICTs. But also, we are having the World Telecommunications Standards Assembly, as, as Malcolm Johnson mentioned, in South Africa this year, where there will be serious discussion about a resolution as to how the IT industry can address this issue. And finally, within our own house in, in Geneva, which is a small house, we only have three fairly uh, medium-sized buildings, we have already conducted a carbon audit, so we've gathered most of the data that we need. We've done a rough analysis of that data. For anybody who's ever done this, you discover parts of your building you never knew existed. We have a very impressive physical plan at the ITU all the way down the, the lower basements that most delegates never see. I had never seen it. But it was, uh, we, we did an audit of that last week. We uh, expect to have the final numbers uh, shortly. And we uh, will have a number of programs to try and reduce our own emissions by, by about 20 to 40 percent. We've done a lot already, as I mentioned, having our recommendations online. We've also moved as much as we, uh, uh, quite a bit to paperless meetings at many of the ITU management functions, at also many of our major meetings now. They're paperless. We've reduced our paper use dramatically in our treaty-making conferences. And we are making quite a bit use of, and have for many years, of remote collaboration tools. So we expect at the end of the day to, we can still do further uh, reductions in our admissions and that uh, the cost to us of achie achieving carbon neutrality will be something in the order of 200,000, 250,000 Swiss francs, which we will use to finance projects for other, in different parts of the world for uh, carbon, uh, carbon neutral projects. So I've wasted a bit of energy by having a slide that says thank you. And this is um, just, to, just to, for those who would like more information, either here in the room or, or listening throughout the planet. Uh, we have a main uh, website on climate change, which is called Climate. We also have a website for this symposium where you can see all the presentations um, and also all the written materials. And then we also have a series of technology watch briefing reports. So I would encourage you as well to, to consult those informations, as well as all the reports that we have done. And, and soon we'll be posting the report of this meeting as well. So I thank you very much for your, for your time. It's 12.28, and I'll give, the, I'll give the mic back to Tim.